Dice Tower Tonight, Episode 25. Eric and Crystal nerd out because Tom's not here. Welcome to Dice Tower Tonight, a video cast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On tonight's show, Tom is on a road trip, so Crystal and I will challenge each other with our own devious games. We'll talk about some recent plays, and then we'll take your questions live. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the Jaina to my Zan, Crystal Pisano. Oh my gosh, I feel like this is a reference I should get. I'm, oh. Oh, I'm really filling the Tom role now because I don't get the reference. I'm slowly, in my quest to take over the Dice Tower, I'm going to eventually morph into all of the aspects of Tom and apparently <laughs> not getting the references is one of them. So what am I missing? Yes. Wonder Twin powers activate. Oh, oh. See, and I am familiar with the Wonder Twins, yep. but I have never actually consumed any Wonder Twin related content. So, wow. That's a yeah, good one, is, though. I like it. This is when I feel old. Ah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> How so, are you it's doing? just us. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm wonderful. Good. And I'm excited to be here. And I'm excited that we don't have to have somebody rolling their eyes at us constantly no. if, we just, if we decide to talk about anything nerdy. It, if, if, that's a big if, you I mean, know, you, you never, never know. know. <laughs> we might be just solidly talking about dry euros all evening. It is entirely, oh gosh, wouldn't that be a funny episode if we just like deadpan <laughs> just talked about euros the whole time? Uh, I did get some comments in uh, our, on our last stream where people were like, I wanted to hear more about the Star Trek convention. And I said, <laughs> I get it. I know. Come to my live Q&A at the end of the month. Uh, there you which go. is now this coming Sunday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific, 12.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern. I will answer all of the Star Trek-related questions that anybody wants to ask me. And if that's none, that's fine. But for anyone who was curious to hear more about my experiences at the convention, uh, that would be the place to ask, not probably tonight. Although, yeah. who knows? Eh, eh, well. eh, you know, eh, <laughs> but, I mean, I was really interested, just based on your tweets, you were just in seventh heaven. You were just I, giddy. Yeah. And super happy. I, you know, there were very few pictures of you. Oh, well, no, there were. There were tons of you. Um, but you always had this giant smile on your face. And so, it's yeah. uh, it's it's a it, it sounds like hyperbole, but it was truly one of the greatest weekends of my entire life. Like it was just that good. So, we'll we'll maybe we'll talk about it later, or people can ask about it at my live Q and A. But this is Dice Tower tonight, a yes. video show all about board games, and uh, we are here to have some fun, I think, yes. is the goal. So uh, we've got a couple games for each other. Eric, do you mind if I go first? Sure. You want to talk about a game or you want to spring a game at me? Oh, I see. Let's, let's, I'll talk about a game first and then we'll, uh, we can do, do we want to do two games and then two game shows or do we want to mix them up? Let's, let's talk about games first, then, then play games ourselves. Okay, I think that sounds good. Yeah. Well, I have a game that you all who watch the show regularly will already know about because Tom uh, submitted us or submitted it to our challenge that we do here on the show. It is the one that he sent me to review, and that is Pococo, the peacock themed trick taking game from Brain Games, who is more well known for their ice cool offerings. Ice cool. Um, Yes, so this, um, I know Tom described it in a previous episode, but just in case anyone wasn't here for that, uh, Pococo is a trick-taking game that kind of uh, borrows a little bit of an aspect from the game Hanabi, although Hanabi is not the only game to do it, but that's the most widely known, where you do not get to see the cards that are in front of you. The, all of the cards go into these little peacocks, uh, and they're in little holders that sit in front of you, and so I would only see the backs, of the cards, everyone else would be able to see the fronts, and then I can see all of the cards that everyone else has in front of them. Uh, you then uh, bid on how many tricks you think everyone else is going to take, and then once everyone has placed bids on everyone else, then you also have to bid on how many tricks you think your hand is going to take, even though you can't see it. So you're using the information from other people's bids to guesstimate how many uh, tricks you think you're going to be able to take. Uh, and then you play cards, not from the hand in front of you, but the hand on your left. So technically, this is not your hand. It is a hand of cards 
that happens to be sitting in front of you, but you can never see what the cards are until they're played, and you don't actually play those cards. So it's not really like Hanabi, because it's not your hand. It's just the hand that's sitting in front of you that you can't see. <laughs> right. Uh, but you play the cards for the player on your left, so you can see the cards that you're playing as you play them. Uh, and then you score points based on how close your bids were. If you get exactly the right number of tricks for a player, you get two points. If you are one off in either direction, you get one point. And then there are some cards that will allow you to uh, make uh, additional wagers. So if you think the purple peacock, the bid that you place for the purple peacock is definitely the right one, this might be the card you pick at the beginning of the round. And if you were exactly on, you will get an extra three points. Uh, if you were off at all, even by one, you will lose one point. Uh, uh, Tom said in his review that these cards can kind of make or break the game score-wise, and I believe that is probably accurate. Um, I liked it. It was fun. Uh, I grew up playing trick-taking games. I played a lot of hearts and spades when I was younger, and I like both of those games. Uh, the gameplay of this is very fun. The Where it falters for me is it's fiddly just in the physical aspects of it. So you've got this hand that's in front of you that you can't see. And like, there was a point, this is possibly my own just dumb moment, but I was like, oh, I should take a picture of this game to post on social media later or whatever. And so I flipped my camera into selfie mode and put the phone in front of my, <laughs> and then had that like flash of, oh no, oh no. <laughs> Uh, and then we had a lot of moments during the game where people were pulling out a card and another card would accidentally come along with it and then fall onto the table and become visible to the person who's not supposed to see it. Um, we had that moment multiple times during the game. And just the, like you're having to reach over to the player on your left and manipulate those cards. So it's not like it's a hand in front of you. Uh, so right. it's very fiddly in a physical way. And that to me is the biggest downside uh, but the game is fun. I liked it. If you're looking for a new trick-taking game that's a little bit different than other trick-taking games, I think this one's actually pretty neat. And I mean, come on, look, look at these peacocks. That's just, they're just great. I didn't put any of the others together so you can see a peacock without it. But they're all different colors and they look wonderful. So this one, I think overall, considering the games Tom subjects us to, I think this one is a winner. <laughs> They look adorable, and so, I mean, it all boils down to a, a trick-taking game in which one hand is secret information. It's not your hand. It's just one of them. Right. And it really isn't your hand in any meaningful way. Yeah. And often that uh, that extra bid that you make at the beginning of the round after all the uh, bids have been placed, that extra card that you select, uh, most of the players that I've played it with have often selected the colored peacock that is on their left that they're going to be playing the cards for because you actually have some control there. Like if you put it on the hand that's in front of yourself, you're not playing those cards. So even if you bid smartly for the layout of cards that exist in the hand, if you're not the one playing them, then it seems kind of silly to make that the, I got this exactly right bid. Whereas the hand on your left, you see those cards, you're the one playing them, you have control there. So I think that most people are often going to pick that as their little bonus bid. But yeah. So yeah. Huh. And the name one more time. Uh, that is Picoco from Brain Games just published in 2018, just recently. I believe it's out now. Um, but yeah, and it's designed by Adam Porter, as you can see on the box, uh, who I believe also designed Doodle Rush, which is not a game I was super keen on, but I know a lot of people like it. So cool. Yeah. Well, go so going along with Picoco, uh, I you chose that one. I ended up with Place in the Sun, which was the sci-fi space game that uh, that looked interesting. Tableau building, uh, you know, cool cards, powers. Uh, this is from Vermin Games and designer Radomir Gadina. Mirchev. Um, this is technically the Kickstarter edition. I don't know what makes it the Kickstarter edition. But the object of the game is that you will be given a planet da -da -da, um, and a disc that represents your civilization and a deck that goes with that civilization. So this may be the, yeah, this is the, the spawn folks. Um, where's their deck in here? This deck, yes, that's them. They have cards like Roach Infestation. So there's four different factions here uh, that all have special powers. 
um, and their deck sort of runs a little bit differently. And the board that you got has a number. This says you start with 40 health, 40 energy at the beginning of the game, but a different board might only start you with 25 health, or, or even I saw one that only has 10, 10 energy at the start of the game, but it's going to have tons of, um, of bonuses that will help you out. Um, the object of the game is to get your opponents to lose all of their energy. Um, and you do this by playing these various types of cards that will add um, planetary structures to your outer rings. You have like four slots that are sort of defensive and your opponents need to attack those before they can hit your planet and actually take away your energy. You have a moon that usually has better defense um, but doesn't act as a shield for your planet. It's sort of like, it's actually a lot like Star Realms where you've got some structures um, that, that are defensive that block attacks toward you. Um, but then there are others that you, people can avoid and not blow up, but you, those are usually the ones with better powers on them, more useful. Similar concept. Uh, and there's action cards that are sort of a, a one-off thing. The, the, the tricky part is that you've got on your disc um, this, this number. This says five right now. You start at three. And there are mechanisms that are going to dial that up or down. What this number means is how many cards you're going to play on your turn. So I may start a turn with it like this, playing three cards from my hand of five, but then later on I might cause that to go up or down, so on my next turn I'll be playing four cards, or only two. Uh, and, and manipulating that, managing that, and each of the four factions sort of manipulates that differently in different ways. That's part of, of this whole thing. Where I ran into some difficulty uh, is, is that those combinations between the board and your faction can come up with some very strange combinations. Like, one of the factions uses energy a lot. It spends it. So you spend three energy to do multiple damage points. You, you, um, and then you have cards that acquire it. But if I pick this board that only starts with 10 energy to begin with, I'm at a pretty big disadvantage. Whereas if I had the one that has 40 to start with, now I've got fuel to run my engine. But I wouldn't necessarily know that. Or if you're just drawing them randomly, you wouldn't necessarily know that. Um, it's also, like you said, on, on your game, fiddly. Um, there's a lot of mechanisms to sort of maneuver. You play a card, may cause you to turn your dial and get some energy. And uh, just the economy is a lot to move around. Uh, there were some issues with the rule book. You have these leader cards that the rules tell you to shuffle and put in a face down stack, but then it doesn't really tell you how to access those cards. You have to just sort of intuit the fact that you can spend an action to flip the first one over and now get access to it and its abilities. Um, and then spend more actions to to sort of cycle them out of that stack into your deck, which then could come back and play from your hand. But because they were, they could be in your hand, the rules keep saying, you can play a leader from your hand to do this, but they have to get out of that stack, into your discard pile, into your draw deck, back into your... Like, just tell me I can flip over the top card of the stack. Um, there's a co-op mode that I attempted. It is not a solo game though um there's there's elements of it that the the bad guy can attack you if he's if you're the only one being attacked as the solo player i don't think it's possible to do any damage to the bad guy um yeah i'm kind of a no on this one it <laughs> it's a lot and i think there there is subtlety here i'm sure that there's stuff to explore it and and as somebody learns the different factions you can probably learn how to manipulate them and 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 play the game well I just didn't have any fun with it. it. It just seemed like a little bit of a slog. It goes on a little long. I played it with some folks at Gen Con and they were lukewarm. Um, it really just, it didn't click for me. So I think this would be a pass from me. That's Place in the Sun from Vermin Game. All right. Yeah, the artwork on that one was neat looking, but I think we were all a little like, we weren't sure about the gameplay, so it could have been great. It could have been interesting and dense, and it it has it has merit. It's got stuff to explore, but it's it feels like it's one of work. based on your description. It seems like it's one of those games that could have maybe used a little bit more development. Like it's a good concept, but just not all the way baked. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's got a, it's got a, those flaws sort of stack up. Here. Yeah. All right. Well, 
Let's uh, let's head into some. Uh, let's challenge each other to some games, shall oh, we? Oh boy, yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, I've got a fun one for you this week, or at least I hope it's going to be fun. I know Tom likes to give us lists of things that no one's going to know, but I think you'll be okay <laughs> at this. And okay. uh, we're not playing for anything, so you're going to win no matter what. It's just a matter of by how much, I guess. Yes. It's like so. when the celebrities are on Ask Me Another or something. They always win. Exactly. Or, or wait, wait, don't tell me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I have a list of 20 names. Those 20 names are, uh, and chat, don't Google this, and don't suggest things in the chat if you do. If you want if you want to be honest and not look it up at all, and you want to help Eric, then I'm okay with that. But don't look <laughs> it up, because it'll be easy to Google. So don't, don't do that, chat. Okay. Uh, this is a list of the 20 most recognizable voices. Uh, as determined by the website IMDb. So whether this is legit, I don't know how they measured it. I don't know how they selected them, but IMDb has a list of the 20 most recognizable voices. Since it is on IMDb, uh, I believe all of them are fairly directly related to the film or television industry in some way, mm. uh, a majority of which are actors. And I will tell you up front that 19 of the 20 are male, and there is one woman on the list. Oh boy! So if you can if you can find her, that will be interesting. And uh, I, I I don't know if I would have thought of her, but as soon as I saw her, I went, oh, of course. So we'll see uh, how you do. We'll just see how many you can get. I will give you. Let's see. Well, uh, let's say I give you how many guesses to get. Uh, there's twenty of them. I don't want to like drag this on forever though. <laughs> And this could be with, this could be disastrous. Yeah, let's say like between ten and fifteen guesses until you run out of steam. Let's just have oh, you. Okay. I don't know. We'll we'll see what you got. So, uh, and I will tell you what their position is on the list. Although I don't actually know if their position on the list means anything. So <laughs> that's fun too. Uh, so there's so many ways this could go because if this is on IMDb, it's probably going to be based on actors who do voice work, um, as opposed to like voice people. Because it's not going to have like Don LaFontaine on that list, even though he's like the movie trailer guy. <clears throat> um, or maybe un unless, unless you know, why not? Let's try Don LaFontaine just hey! to get things started. Don LaFontaine is on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you got that. That was so how? good. Uh, he is number ten again. I don't actually know if being number ten means anything. But uh, yeah, Don LaFontaine, the famous, uh, so most, a lot of people in the chat might not recognize his name, but he is one of the most notable voices ever in movie trailer history. And he, until his uh, passing, did a whole lot of movie trailers. So people know his voice, even if they don't recognize his name. Hmm. So the fact that he's on there has me wondering how many animation people are probably on here. I oh. can tell you... I believe there is only one person who is primarily known for animation, and it is not somebody I was previously familiar with, but that doesn't mean that wouldn't be the case for you. Oh, boy. How about Frank Welker? Frank Welker is not on the list. He was Starscream um, oh, from Transformers. Okay. Uh, uh, um, Rob Paulson? Rob Paulson. No. No. See, I'm I'm going too far into the animation. Yeah, I think I think maybe think more mainstream actors uh, who have like notable voices or. How about Clint Eastwood? Clint Eastwood. I'm 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 confirming because I'm kind of surprised. I. He is not not on the list. On the list, there is somebody who I would say people would maybe mention in the same sentences as Clint Eastwood for various <laughs> reasons, potentially for very you know. Uh, but no, no Clint Eastwood on the oh, list. Boy. Um, Robert Redford. Robert Redford, also not on the list. No, I am. I'm going the wrong direction here. It's okay. I know. I've, I've made, it's a Tom game all of a sudden. I told you I'm turning into him. So <laughs> I See, I was going to say George Clooney. 
he does a lot of of commercial work, and I feel like people recognize him. But you're shaking your head. You were gonna go with George Clooney, but I, you're not. I, <laughs> George, oh, I I um, shouldn't go with George Clooney because that's think, a terrible idea. No, no. Uh, let's think. Tom doesn't uh, give clues either. You, you are you. I know. I think this you're is still more far fun. away from him. Um, well, because you know, it's it's. Let's think about people who have played notable roles in uh, ongoing movie series. So. Um, is some nerdy stuff and some less nerdy stuff, but um, <laughs> series of movies that have big name male actors in them that uh, happen to be have voices that are recognizable, potentially. There's at least a handful of those on this list. <laughs> that's that's a lot of things. I know. I'm trying um, to be vague and also helpful, and it's not working out at all. Uh, how about Mark Hamill? It's just, you're, it's not, no, <laughs> but he, he does a lot of voice work. So I think yep. that that's a good guess, but, uh, uh there, there may about, be a co-star of his. How about Harrison Ford? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. How many people can I name that are not the one you're thinking of? I don't know, but that's a fun game. Name all of the people except <laughs> for the specific one. I just said Pacific one. That's. <laughs> Oh goodness! Uh, uh, well, it's, if you wanted to look at the chat, they've said it a number of times since we started the game. <laughs> but uh, the obvious one. Um, all right, Sylvester Stallone. Somebody said in the chat. I'm just going to throw that one out there. Sylvester Stallone is surprisingly not on the list. Uh huh. I'm sorry. This is a Tom game. All of a sudden. Yeah. I thought. Uh, I thought. How... I, I thought this would be good. <laughs> No, James Earl Jones. Somebody said this is CNN. Number one on the list, there James Earl Jones, uh, who's obviously most notably known for his role in The Sandlot. Yes, yeah, of course. That's the first thing I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, all right, so James Earl Jones. I have to think along those those lines. Um, I. So we've got um. No, not many, not many super modern people. Like there aren't, uh, like people that were maybe pretty famous uh, in the '80s and '90s, or even a few that are older than that. Um, although there's some stuff from the 2000s. Uh, a lot of some of these people are not living anymore. Um, oh, okay. Well, how about Michael Jackson then? Michael Jackson is not on the list. There are no musicians or no dedicated musicians on the list. So. It's all pretty much just. I mean, I know Michael Jackson was in some acting Captain EO. roles, but okay, yes, Captain EO. Okay. Uh... <laughs> these these people are primarily known for their work in movie or film. I should say. We did Clean Eastwood. Um, okay, so I wonder if I could start quoting movies. <laughs> <laughs> so um Al Pacino. There's no Al Pacino. You're naming so many good people that should again, this list is arbitrarily made by IMDb. So, it's just probably wrong. Oh, arbitrarily made. Oh, so in that I case I don't know. I, I I mean, I'm not a scientist at IMDb. <laughs> so uh Oh, someone in the chat said Patrick Stewart, and I do wish he was on this list. He He's should not. be on that list. He should He's be on very recognizable. So um, what if I said uh, somebody who might be acquainted with the dude? Oh, um, well, now I can't remember his name. I The guy from Tron. You know, that guy. Wait, is he in Tron? Isn't he? I don't know. Oh, is he? <laughs> how, how, about, how about John Goodman? John Goodman, no. Um, okay, we'll do three more guesses. And oh, I will give good. you some clues. Okay, so how about I'll give you a series of movies. Yes. And there is at least there's a single person uh on here from that series of movies. So we'll say the uh series that's based on the novels of Thomas Harris, which uh consist of things such as The Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal. 
Oh, okay. Um, so that is... Oh, my goodness. Anthony. Um, You're Anthony, there. Hopkins. Yay! Anthony Hopkins. Yay! Number seven on the list. I was <laughs> going to su suggest Jodie Foster, too, because she does... She's not the one but woman on the list. She's not the one woman on the list. No, the woman on the list, uh, I would say, is known not for a pretty voice, but for a... Is it Fran Drescher? It sure is. <laughs> That's the only... That was my alternate victory condition. That's all I need. Yeah, you got the That's... one woman on the list. Um, and then, let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, an actor who... Starred in a popular nerdy series of movies that were based on books, as well as a movie that many people claim is their favorite Christmas movie. I'm trying. Oh. To... Okay. Um. So that's gonna be. <laughs> I'm that too vague. I just gonna be Bruce Willis. Wait, no, what? Alan Rickman. There Alan you Rickman. go. You got Alan it. Rickman. Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman. Yes. Oh, yay. Oh, okay, I'll go through the rest of the list, and you're Please. probably going to have some like face, Picard face palm moments. Uh, so, Vincent Price was number two. Yes. Horror, king of horror. Yes. Uh, James Stewart, Jimmy Stewart, number three. Mm -hmm. Sean Connery, uh, <laughs> yes. number four. Uh, Morgan Freeman, number five. Yeah. Uh, Sam Elliott. Did we? Did you guess him? I don't think I highlighted I it. Did. You got Sam Elliott. Oh, did you not get to say? No. Okay, so he was the one for the uh, acquaintance with of the dude. <laughs> okay. You guessed Anthony Hopkins. Uh, William Daniels, Roger Jackson. You got Don LaFontaine, George Sanders, Sterling Holloway, Alan Rickman. You got John Wayne, who is the one I was ah. saying, it's kind of like Clint Eastwood, but yep. not. And and John Wayne, I think, is who I was thinking of, but I couldn't. Oh, really? Think of yeah, yeah. Uh, Christopher Walken. Yes. Gene Hackman. Uh, Kelsey okay. Gr Kelsey Grammer. Yep. Uh, you guessed Fran Drescher. This one, Samuel L. Jackson, of course. Yes. Yes. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, in the world of notable voices, Gilbert Gottfried. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Oh, uh, so it didn't go as well as I'd hoped, but hopefully no. that was amusing. I should have, I should have had you do impressions of them, but uh, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> no. At that point, no. All right, let's hope your game is better than mine because mine was a stinker this week. Oh, let's hope. Okay, so um, we know that you are a dog lover, Crystal. I am a dog lover. Uh, are you familiar with the term um, designer dog? I have heard that term before. It's basically a highfalutin mutt, uh, okay. you know, a designer yeah. or hybrid dog breed, uh, yeah. which are, you know were very popular a few years ago. They're still pretty popular now, right? And they have cutesy names, which are usually so, a combination of the two breeds that they're. Yes. So I I found uh, in two different sources uh, a list of top ten hybrid dog breeds. Oh, designer dog breeds. Now, uh, I, I went to two different places because neither one had a whole lot of scientific data behind it, like sales numbers or, or you know, social media findings. of. I don't work, know where these statistics came from. So I had, went to multiple sources to look, and the two lists were virtually identical, except for one that was different on the two lists. So I actually have a top 11 of the most popular designer dog breeds. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give you, let's say, 10 guesses, okay. and we'll see how many you can get. All right. Well, I've hidden the chat already. I'm going to okay. try. I don't think I'll be able to get more than probably three or four. Okay. But uh, Cockapoo has to be on the list. Cockapoo is number one. That okay. is a That's, Cocker Spaniel Poodle mix. Yep. That almost feels like people treat that as if it's an actual like breed at this point. Like Cockapoos oh. are kind of ubiquitous, I think. Right. Um, people do like to combine things with Poodles. In general, because poodles are really intelligent, so let's go with Peekapoo as well, which is a Pekingese and a poodle together. Uh, Peekapoo, hmm, Peekapoo, surprisingly not on the list. Not on the list. No, okay. but I think you're thinking along the right lines. 
Yeah, I know a poodle's gonna show up. Uh, fun fact for everyone out there, my very first dog when I was a kid was uh, half Bichon, which uh, one of my current dogs is a Bichon, and half Cockapeekapoo. So it was a Cocker Spaniel Pekingese poodle mix and a Bichon. So we called her a cockapeekapoo <laughs> which was just ridiculous, but she was adorable. So <laughs> her name was Brittany and I okay. love her. All right. Uh, okay. So now I've stalled for a little while. I still haven't <laughs> thought of some good stuff. All right. Yep. So uh, actually Bichons are popular for designer breeds too. Ooh, Labrador, Labradoodle, Labradoodle. Labradoodle is number three. Okay. The Labrador poodle mix. Yeah. People like to combine stuff with poodles. Mm-hmm. Uh, Golden Doodle also. Golden Doodle is number four. That's okay. a golden retriever in a poodle. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I'm trying to think what other breeds other than poodle are like commonly combined with. Because it's often like they pick something that's smaller or doesn't shed or is smarter or more well-behaved. Mm -hmm. um, Multi-poo. A multi poo. Yep, that's number two. Multi -poo. Yay! One of my other dogs is uh, so I have a I have a poodle mix, I have a Maltese, and I have a Bichon. So they're my my dogs are the what designer dogs are made of, I guess. So so far you are four out of five. You're on a oh, roll. Okay, okay, okay. It's gonna get worse shortly, probably. Um I feel like I know of something that gets combined with Chihuahuas. Like it's a chi something, but I can't think of what the other half of it would be. Mm -hmm. um, although if you start thinking about a chihuahua and very large dogs, it gets ridiculous very quickly. So <laughs> not. <laughs> um, some any any other doodles? I'm trying to think. Um, there's at least one other doodle on here. There's one other doodle. <laughs> Okay, um, so there's lots of stuff that aren't doodles. So cocker spaniels. So a, is there other and something other than a cockapoo? Is the thing a cocka cocka? I should probably not be saying that over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> Tom's gonna come back and be like, Crystal, what did you do? I swear it's dog breeds. I'm not the worst. I promise. Um, cocker spaniel. Cocker spaniel. As a hint, uh, I own one of these. I don't actually know what breed you own. I should know that. I know that the dog was below you right before we went on stream, but I didn't get to yeah, see it. I didn't lift her up so you could see. Oh. So let's see. Let, ooh, um, dachshunds are popular. So are beagles? Dachshund. Dachshund. Dachs. <laughs> if, if somebody put a poodle and a dachshund together it could be like a no i'm not gonna say that it's i'm being ridiculous i'm just gonna stop ah uh, my brain is running out of stuff let's say chi poo like chihuahua a, poodle a chi poo is not not on here no okay. no chi poo i'm just gonna keep putting stuff in front of poo uh -huh. <laughs> like a reasonable course of action you you could also if you were using uh poodle as a combination you could use just the oodle and not the poo <laughs> just just use the oh use your oodle just use the oodle <laughs> uh schnoodle the schnauzer Schno no. schnoodle is number seven on the Yay! list yes. i know more about designer dog breeds than i thought <laughs> You you know me so well, Eric. <laughs> uh, I hope the chat is enjoying this because I can't I hope see so it. Too. <laughs> All right. Um, how many have I guessed? Uh, you've guessed five out of your six guesses. So I've guessed, guessed more five. than six times. I think. No, I mean you said words, but I don't think any. Oh. Of <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get to ten. I'm I'm All running right. out of steam pretty quickly. We'll try. How about uh, two more guesses? Two more. Okay. Um. Yeah, what are really, really like? Are there any things else you could combine with? Like, if you combined a Labrador 
and a golden retriever. Does it, is a golden lab, is that a breed or is that just a color of lab? No, because there's like white, black, and brown. I'm going to say golden lab. I don't know. Uh, it's not It's not on the list. Okay. I think you can probably put those two together, but. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th there's no rules against I know, there's it. no rules. <laughs> they just don't get a silly name, that's all. Yeah. Um, one more. One more. Am I still? Do, is there still one oodle left? There's. Uh, there is. There is. There are no more oodles, but oh, there's no. a poo left. There is a poo. <laughs> okay. Uh, we will say. I already guessed that. I already guessed that. What other poo could there be? <laughs> it's, every time I say a phrase, I regret it immediately. <laughs> Dog breeds are full of potholes. It's, it's, they really are. <laughs> we made a horrible mistake. <laughs> um, I already said Labradoodle. It's an oodle. Or no, it's a poo. Poo. It's a <laughs> we are exactly um, 12. We'll say uh, I, Doxy Poo. I don't think that's a thing. But No, no. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's go with number 11, which is a Pitsky which is a pit bull husky mix. That is not something I would have chosen to do intentionally. <laughs> I knew not of that. Yeah. Uh, number 10 is a Cheeks, which is a Chihuahua peeking ease. Oh, see, and I thought that Chihuahua would be involved somewhere. I just couldn't, but that's a weird name. I wouldn't have gotten there either. Uh, a Pomchi is number nine. That's a Pomeranian Chihuahua. Okay, I think I've heard of that. The the poo you missed is the Yorkie poo. Ah, Yorkie poo. Poodle. Uh, and uh, number five was a Malshi, a Maltese Shih Tzu. Okay. And the one that you missed that's mine is my Puggle. The oh, Pug of Beagle course, mate. a Puggle! But Aww. you did incredibly well, and, and you got the top ones, one, two, three, and four, right across the board. So well done. You did better than I did. That's for sure. <laughs> well, but that's probably because the person creating the game did a better job. I, uh, <laughs> I trusted you were like, you did science. You were like, I compared multiple lists and I'm like, I looked up a thing on IMDB <laughs> and this is what we got. <laughs> oh, Oh, they're giving dog jokes on the chat. I so just it, saw that. <laughs> If there is something you'd like to ask me or Crystal, now is your time. Uh, we do have a few minutes uh, left to go before before our time is up. Uh, if, if there's anything you'd like to know about our recent trips or recent games or just anything, uh, I, I'd love to see it on the chat. Go ahead and type those in. Oh, and I did see earlier, uh, way back in the stream, Trevor asked um, how Picoco compares, I think it was Trevor that asked it, uh, how it compares to Tichu. And I have never played Tichu. I know that Whoa. sounds like a crime. So yeah, I've never played it. I know it's very popular and a lot of people love it. And I haven't avoided it. I've just never played it. So I can't compare yeah. them. I mean, it's a, it's an excellent game. I, I don't, I'm not fanatical the way that some people are about Tichu. Um, I enjoy it. Uh, it's, it's definitely one of those that, that, if you, your partner is really, really good at it, you can feel a lot of pressure from them um, to, to do well. And there's, you know, that, there's almost more pressure from your partner than there is from your opponents. Yeah, I mean, the spades can be like that as well. Uh, like when I was in high school, I had buddies that we would play spades uh, in choir class. Once we got done rehearsing, uh, we'd play spades. And that was intense. <laughs> hmm. Um, oh, okay. So lots of Dice Tower West questions popping up. So, yes. so in case anyone in the chat is not aware, uh, Dice Tower West was announced at Gen Con. We've talked about it a little bit previously. Dice Tower West is an evolution of an existing convention called MeepleCon here in Las Vegas, where I live, that I help run. I am uh, the social media manager for what was MeepleCon and what is now Dice Tower West. And it's kind of neat for me because I was already involved in MeepleCon and I was already involved in the Dice Tower. And now those two things are merging and that's really exciting. Uh, so I will definitely be there <laughs> because I will be working. Although since I am social media, Media manager, luckily, I will get to play some games while I'm working, which is pretty neat. Um, 
And let's see, how excited are we? I'm very excited. I don't know about you, Eric. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I've, I've never been to MeepleCon. So, uh, you know, Tom, Sam, and Z were the ones that got to go the past couple years. I've always had to run away to go to my local convention, ConCon, which was the week after Gamma, uh, the weekend after Gamma. But now it's actually Dice Tower West is the weekend before Gamma this, this coming year. And then I think I then leave. At, so we do Dice Tower West and then Gamma. And then I leave to make it to ConCon. You are going to be one tired boy at the end of I, all that. I'm not sure I've gotten quite the thumbs up for that yet, but that would be the schedule if I go to all of the events. Okay. But I am planning to be there for Dice Tower West for sure. Which I'm so excited about because we've, um, you know, yeah, Tom, Sam, and Z have come. Uh, Derek has been with them for yep. the past couple of years. Um, and they've brought a couple other people along as well. And we actually just announced today that Rado, Richard Ham, is going to be coming as well. He came to MeepleCon not this past year, but I believe the year before. He's only been once. Um, he piggybacked off of Gamma to come one year. Right. Uh, so we're excited to have him back. And obviously, we will probably have more notable people that will be attending that we just haven't announced yet. Um, so someone asked about the motel room or hotel room costs for Dice Tower West. Uh, all of that is uh, on the website. If you go to DiceTowerWest.com, the only reason I'm pushing you there at this moment is because I don't have them in front of me and I don't want to be wrong about what right. the costs are. Um, but it's pretty neat because for, with every hotel room, you get two free breakfast buffets every day. Uh, and that is pretty awesome and not very common. It's part mm. of our arrangement with the hotel. Yeah. So yeah, very cool. So if, uh, you want to save a little money on food, that's an easy way to do it. If I know Tom is the type that will go to a buffet and just pig out <laughs> so he doesn't have to eat again for a while. Right. You have to leave eventually to go play some games. But Totally. Uh, and the we're going to be at the West Gate, which uh, was a, used to be the Hilton back in the day and then was the LVH for a little while and has been renovated and is the West Gate now and is quite lovely. So we're pretty excited. Cool. And tickets for the convention go on sale in now less than two weeks. September 4th, which is a Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so put that in your calendar now. We are pretty sure tickets are going to sell out quickly. There are a lot of local gamers here in Vegas who uh, obviously plan on coming. They've been coming to MeepleCon for four previous years. Um, so if you're from out of town, snatch up those tickets quickly. Um, yeah. And we would, we're so excited to see all of you and to have all of you come play games with us in Vegas. Tom, Sam, and Z have been talking very positively about MeepleCon for a number of years, which makes us feel all warm and fuzzy. Um, but we've always focused first and foremost on open gaming, um, mm -hmm. and we are going to continue to do that. So I imagine people who have been to, well, it's not even an I imagine, I've been now to Dice Tower Con twice. Uh, Dice Tower Con and Dice Tower West are going to have very similar feels. Dice Tower West is just going to be smaller for now. So yeah. eventually they will probably be comparable in size, but we're going to ramp things up as we go. Yeah. Uh, Cthulhu Crisis asks a question about a one-night ultimate supervillains. Yes, that's me uh, on, on that new uh, Bezier one-night product. Um, any chance of getting you added on where words? No, I think they've already done two narrators on that one. And, uh, and so, no, no, I think, I think they wanted to have a different product from the one night ultimate, um, you know, games, the one night games and whatever where words was, which is fine. They're, they're still giving me plenty of work for, for the one night games. And I think with the added Kickstarter, uh, villains that they've added, I think I get to do another round of narration there. So I get to create some new, new voices for like voodoo loo and stuff like that. I love, I loved doing the narration for that one because each person has their own little personality and so i get to have a lot of fun with the vocal gymnastics on that one it's pretty cool that's awesome and there was another question uh right below that uh eric have you ever been approached to record a digital voice uh something <laughs> in the vein of siri oh boy uh i i mean i've, I've done some uh phone systems and stuff but that, that's not really quite the same thing uh, you know, when, when you call up and it's the automated system and I say, thanks for calling such and such insurance company for Joe, press one or, you know, that, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, some of those can be pretty complex, uh, but I've never done anything quite at the level of Siri or any of the Siri voices. It well, would be fun. Siri didn't even know she was Siri. She recorded some stuff like 
a ton of words and phrases and syllables at one point or whatever, and then later found out, oh, she's Siri. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but no, no one, no one. I, I imagine they would have to tell somebody that they were doing that now. Now that it's a thing, um, whoever was doing it would probably ask for more money. I mean, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel asks, how does one break into audiobook narration? Um you get lucky when Audible is expanding their roster and happen to have a demo completed and online at that particular moment. That's at least how I did it. Um, I, I had taken some classes, done some training, got a demo together, uh, and Audible was expanding their roster. And they, they sent an email and said, hey, you know what? You want to send us some demos? Uh, here's some demo scripts. And they, they hired me for a book. Let's see how it goes. And they kept doing it. So that's, uh, that's how I got the ball rolling. I think if you're trying to get into it now, it's it's worth exploring LibriVox, which is a, uh, they record public domain books. It can give you some good practice uh, recording some material. Uh, also, ACX, the Audiobook Creation Exchange at acx.com is where um, authors, like indie authors, can connect with producers and narrators to produce their audiobook, um, sometimes for a royalty share. So it's... Um, no, no money up front for them. And then you share. If the book does well, you do well. Uh, it, it's, it's still a pretty good investment. You have to have your own equipment or some method of recording yourself. But it's one way to, to get your toe in the water. Um, Netters asked if people can reserve hotel rooms for Dice Tower West yet. And no. Uh, d uh, the code for the hotel group will be released the same day that tickets go on sale. So you cannot book hotel rooms yet. Oh, uh, let's see. A lot of people talking about MeepleCon and Dice Tower West. Does the Dice Tower have more or less or the same involvement with Dice Tower West as Dice Tower Con? The announcements seem to indicate the Dice Tower would be more involved in the running and planning of the con. Uh, Crystal, you may know more about that. I'm not directly involved with either of the conventions as far as the planning side. And I will say that I am not directly involved with regular Dice Tower Con, so there is a chance that anything I'm about to say will not be exactly accurate. So nobody go running around and telling Tom that I said things, because this is just going to be from what I understand. Um, so the Dice Tower uh, proper, Tom, Sam, Z, are heavily involved in the regular Dice Tower convention but they do not run the Dice Tower convention. Patrick and Molly and a crew, their crew run that convention and Tom, Sam and Z and all of that and everybody else, Eric, uh, me, everybody else is just very heavily involved in what happens. Now, Tom donates a lot of games to the library. He has a very uh, important role in planning the events that are going to go on, obviously. So he's very involved with it, but he's not the head of the convention itself, if that makes sense. Uh, he's a figurehead, so to speak, and he's very involved. I, So I am not the head of what was MeepleCon and what is Dice Tower West. Um, I have two cohorts here in Las Vegas, Tim and David. Uh, they uh, do most of the logistical things for Dice Tower West. And now Tom is helping with that stuff. But since Tom lives in Florida and we're here in Las Vegas, obviously there's only certain things that he can do. So I would say the, the complete answer to your question would be, I believe Tom's involvement will be similar for both events in that he is not the primary go-to person for either as an event, but he will be heavily involved in the decision-making process and the events that go on during it. And I hope that answered your question. <laughs> uh, I am our social media person. I am happy to do that because I more than that would be difficult for me based on all of the other board game content stuff that I'm involved in and my you know actual day job that is 40 plus <laughs> hours a week. So uh, I've gotten to the point where I'm kind of I told Eric before we went live, I was like, man, I manage way too many social media <laughs> accounts at this point. Uh, it's fun and I enjoy it though. So, and I honestly, I've told everybody the only reason, not the only reason, the primary reason that I've been involved in MeepleCon here in Las Vegas is because it's my way of giving back to the board game community here in the place that I live. Mm -hmm. And that's been something that's been very important to me. And I think growing it 
and making it more accessible to people outside of Las Vegas is a really neat way to do that because then it gives the people here in Vegas more people to play with and more opportunities and potentially more vendors or publishers or whatever else. Um, so that's really the reason I do it. And it, I, I whine about it sometimes cause I, you know, get a little overwhelmed, but honestly, like hearing the good feedback after the fact and seeing how happy and how much fun everybody has at the event, it makes it all worth it. Mm. So speaking of day jobs, uh, since you guys play a large number of games, both with your game groups and your families, do you ever feel overgamed? And what other hobbies work well with gaming for you? I never feel overgamed unless it's like right after a convention. Um, because there's, sorry, there's... Sir, Sterling is yelling about something. Like, I don't know what. <laughs> I want to play a game. Um, I'll, I'll mute my mic for a moment. <laughs> so I, I I often feel like uh, there are way more games than there is time to play them. And uh, I often have to spend what could be gaming time uh, prepping for an another book or doing some editing or, you know, getting getting work done. The day job uh, sort of takes precedence sometimes. So I would love to get to play more or I wish my kids, you know, were, were more willing to sit down to play something uh, instead of, you know, watching a TV show or, or wanting to play some video games, but you got to reach a balance. And, um, as far as other hobbies go, <laughs> do, do video, does video game count as a separate hobby? That would be, I, think I don't know. Does. Um, I, I like, I like watching movies and listening to music. I guess that those can go well with, um, with gaming, at least for, uh, for familiarity with, with IPs or, uh, as, as background music while you're playing. But those are my primary interests. I think beyond that, I've I've got to be prepping the next book. Yeah, I think I think my answer is kind of similar to yours. I don't typically get gamed out aside from sometimes after big conventions. Although I've noticed that even though I'm going to more conventions now than I ever have, it's that specific feeling has happened to me less and less because as I've gotten to know people at the conventions I go to. I've realized that while board games are at the center of the event, for me, I spend a more a higher percentage of my time enjoying the company of the people rather than trying to play all of the games. Because it used to be, play as many games as I can for three days straight because I can and that's fun. And I still would theoretically like to do that. But as I've gotten to know more people, um, and not just like board game content creators or Tom and those guys, um, but like just people that attend events consistently, um, I'll see somebody I know and I enjoy interacting with them. So I think it's easier for me not to get burned out because I'm not playing board games all day, every day for multiple days in a row. Very, that's not, that's pretty rare for me at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are times when I'm like, just you know, it's not even that I'm gamed out. It's just that I'm lifed out and I kind of just need to decompress. And so I'll, board games will get cut. Like I will skip game night once in a great while. I play currently at least once a week, always. And then occasionally I play two nights a week or three nights a week, a little more rarely. So I'm not overwhelming myself. Um, I don't typically play games at home that often. My husband and I play together, but not frequently. Um, so I usually just go play with my game group on Thursday evenings uh, and then occasionally on Saturday nights. So I think I've, I've struck a pretty good balance. Although, yeah, like you, Eric, it, there's always too many games and not enough time. Yes. Uh, Jerry asks if I've uh, been able to play Spy Club with my kids and how well that's working. Uh, Spy Club was top of my list for must get at Gen Con. Uh, it's, it's a cooperative game uh, that is it's basically like a, a symbol matching almost an exploration you've got these two-sided cards and you're spending actions to flip them and try and get sets of them into the center of the table in order to solve aspects of a case but the real key is that you're supposed to play over five games uh, and each game based on what aspect of the case you've discovered will unlock aspects from this sort of uh it's it's not a legacy deck it's like a campaign deck uh so if i found the game pieces and I've named that as the, the element of the master case that I discovered this turn. That's going to lead me to a certain card in the deck, which tells me to add a mechanism, add powers, add other rules to the system. Uh, and, and then you play again with these new rules in addition to trying to just solve the master case. 
And uh, my kids have been away at what we call grandma grandpa camp. Uh, <laughs> so the the both sets of grandparents, both my in-laws and my folks, have taken one child for a week. And over this past weekend, we switched them. We met and 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 flip flopped. And um, br I brought Spy Club, and we played two rounds. My eldest was not terribly engaged. I think there were other things. When you're at grandma and grandpa's house, there were more things to do than play a game with dad. This happens too often. It's not something special. Uh, my youngest was not as interested until he heard there were player powers that he could claim, that we unlocked something. Like, if you achieve this particular thing, you get a special power. And he's like, oh, well, yes, I would like to play the game too now, yes. And that's all he wanted to do was claim that special power. So it it hasn't quite engaged as well as I hoped it would. But I'm not giving up hope yet. I think that was more the circumstances of Grandma Grandpa Camp, yay, you know, than, um, than any flaw in the game. I'm still interested and I want to see where this goes. And there's so much to explore in that. It's like 180 cards in the campaign deck to explore. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. I, I, I definitely went to grandma grandpa camp when I was a kid. And it's so funny because when I was little, I always thought that it was like a treat or a special thing for my sister and I. I didn't realize that it was a much bigger treat for mom and dad to get rid of the kids for a week. Like I had no idea. I was like, yeah, we get to go to grandma and grandpa's house and fun gaming memory, although not board gaming. We did play board games at grandma's house, but the best was when we could convince my grandma to play Super Mario on the Nintendo. Yep. Because when grandma would play Nintendo, she always moved the same direction Mario was moving. So she'd hold the controller and go like this <laughs> as she was moving Mario around the screen. And it was the best, like so good. I couldn't even like, oh, I just I would just let grandma play as long as she wanted because I just loved watching her do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm, I'm not seeing much more on the uh, on the chat. Everybody's just sort of talking amongst themselves, which is awesome. I love That's that you great. all are just kind of hanging out with each other in the chat. Um, I feel like I saw one question earlier, um, one other about Dice Tower West. Oh, yeah. so for Dice Tower West, it is a, a single badge that gets you all five days of the convention. There are no tickets for each individual day. It's eighty bucks. You get all five days. Uh, we're keeping things simple, especially because we do expect to sell out. So that is how that's going to work. But yeah, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So it sounds like we should probably wrap this up. Um, anything exciting coming up for you in the next couple of weeks, Eric? Well, uh, I guess it's it's just a few weeks away. I'm going to be at uh, Grand Con in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, in let's, let, let's look at the calendar here. It's September. It's the 14th, 15th, 16th that I'll be there for Grand Con. Uh, and I'm excited because I grew up in Michigan, grew up in Kalamazoo, so it's it's not far away from from my old stomping grounds. I have yet to to be at this convention. This is a new one for me. Uh, Mandy will be there as well. Uh, we'll be doing a podcast recording from there. I don't think it's an event. I think Mandy and I are just going to find some time to record. Uh, but I I am doing a a D and D themed improv show. Two different nights um, that I am. There's a group that does this. They, I think it's Crits Happen is the name of the group. And, uh, and they, they basically run a scenario and then they act out what's happening in the scenario. So I might play a dragon and then they'll like be like, oh, so what traits does this dragon have? Well, he blows bubbles. And so I might need to blow bubbles whenever I interact with anyone. I, I don't know. I'm kind of terrified, but it should be, <laughs> it should be a blast. So that's coming up at Grand Con. That sounds pretty cool. Um, and yeah, for me in the next couple of weeks, uh, nothing specifically special board game related, although I mentioned it earlier in the show, but for those of you who weren't here, my monthly uh, Q&A, which is just me, my board game brunch stream is this coming Sunday, uh, which the date of which I'm going to actually pull up, uh, August 26th uh, at 9.30 a.m. Pacific, 12.30 p.m. Eastern. So, you know, get your mimosas alcoholic or not, <laughs> and your waffles, and come join me for brunch on Sunday morning, and I will talk all about the Star Trek convention if that is something that people are still interested in. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, we'll wrap things up, and we will see you all again most likely in two weeks. Uh, but until then, 
I'm Crystal Pisano. And I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been watching Dice Tower tonight. Thanks for watching. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. Tom, Crystal, and I will see you in two weeks for another installment. Our show is supported by viewers like you. Thank you. Dice Tower Tonight is produced by Tom, Crystal, and me with assistance from Derek Porter and Rob Searing. Our battles decided entirely by flipping milk caps provided by the Pogs of War. <laughs> Timothy Pinkham composed our theme and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc. where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Give us your feedback on the Dice Tower Guild at Board Game Geek on Facebook or Twitter or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network. Find something new at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all of us at the Dice Tower, have, have fun, fun gaming. gaming. Bye, everyone. Live long and prosper. <laughs>